Good morning, church. Let me, let me try that one more time. Good morning, church. Is anybody out there? All right. It is so good to be in the house of the Lord with you guys this morning. As we begin our service off, let's go ahead and stand in the honor of reading of God's word. Psalm 133, one of the shortest uh, chapters in the Bible, says this. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. And so as we dwell together in unity this morning, let's go ahead and praise the Father, praise the Son, and praise the Holy Spirit. We're going to sing, To God Be the Glory. So let's lift our voices. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give Him the glory, great things He has done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God. The vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give Him the glory, great things He has done. Great things He has taught us, great things He has done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be how wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give Him the glory, great things He has done. Oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give Him the glory, great things He has done. And give Him the glory, great things He has done. And give Him the glory, great things He has done. Name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saves you, 
by His grace and crown Him Lord of all. Hail Him who saves you by His grace and crown Him Lord of all. Let every kindred terrestrial ball to him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all to him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all oh that with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall we'll join the everlasting song and crown him lord of all we'll join the everlasting song and crown him Kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball. That is our goal, that is our hope, that is our prayer, that uh, during this time, the church age, that every tribe, tongue, and nation come to know Christ as a Savior and be able to someday fall at his feet and crown him Lord of all. Uh, A couple announcements for you guys. Women's ministry event is October 30th. So October 30th, Curtis Orchard um, in Champaign. So you're going to meet there. Uh, If you want to find out about carpooling, you just need to uh, go to the women's Facebook page and um, look on there on how you can get involved. And and you also need to respond on the women's Facebook page. Let them know um, that you're coming. And then if you need carpooling, let them know and they'll figure that out. So um, October 30th uh, is that event. Also, um, we've got two uh, big things coming up. Okay, two big things. We have our, our... leadership proposal of the changes that are going to happen if we vote in that direction at Riverside. They're in the back in the foyer. Um, It's a pretty big document. It talks about all the whys behind why we're doing this um, biblically. So why are we we doing this? So please get that, um, especially members of Riverside, but anyone can take one and look at where we're headed as a church, um, where we're hoping to head, and Read that proposal so you can be well informed on why we're doing that. And then we're going to have a Q&A um, on that proposal on November 7th at 6.30 p.m. So November 7th, that's a Sunday, Sunday night, 6.30 p.m. We're going to have a Q&A on, on that proposal. So any questions that you have, come to that meeting. And then we will have our new constitution out in the Welcome Center Um, for a month as well. And that's going to be on the desk on November 14th, and it'll be there till December 12th. So you can get it for a whole month, check it out, uh, read it, and then we'll have a QA and a on that on December 12th at 6.30 p.m. to discuss um, the changes and any questions that you have about the Constitution. So it's a pretty big deal, so make sure you get those papers um, again, in the foyer, and they'll be there for the next two months. First the proposal, then the Constitution. Um, at this point, I'd like to have everyone um, stand up for the reading of Scripture. This is our text for this morning, but I wanted to do this with the kids uh, here with us. And kids, I want you to listen up, and if you have your Bible with you, turn to Ephesians 4, and you can follow along with me. Ephesians 4, family Uh, the whole family, verse 25 through 32. I believe this passage really applies to family life, um, both in our biological families, but also in our church family, in our church body. 
So uh, read with me here, and then I'm going to have the kids come up, and we're going to have a little kid lesson, okay? So um, for you guys, anyone uh, really fourth grade on down, we're going to have you come on up, and I'm going to do I've got an object lesson for you on this text, okay? So Ephesians 4, 25 through 32, and I forgot that we actually are going to have it up on the board as well. So um, you've got two places to look at it, your own Bible or up there. And read along with me, actually. Let's do this. Let's read along together. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. You may be seated. And, And kids, you can come up here and sit up here in one of these pews, and I have a demonstration for you. So I'd like you guys to come on up. Um, And really, the reason why we talk about this verse in families, um, so yeah, just sit. Actually, I don't know if all of you guys sit right here. we got enough room. So all you guys sit right there, and I'm going to bring this over here. In families is where we have the most um, real relationships going on. When you're in school or you're out away from everybody, it's easy for you to kind of put on a happy face. But when you're with your family, that's the real you, you know. And that verse we just talked about talked about, like, only letting things come out of your mouth that are kind and good for building up, you know? And that's hard to do, isn't it? It's really hard to do. We all struggle with that. We all make mistakes with that. We say things that we're like, man, I wish I didn't say that. I wish I could take that back. Now, I don't know if you've ever uh, gotten uh, squeezed out too much toothpaste. You guys have probably done that? Oh, yeah. And your parents just love it, I'm sure, right? On the sink. Yeah. So you get too much toothpaste out. And once you get that toothpaste out, it's not very easy to put it back in, is it? Not very easy. You could probably do it, but it would make a mess. It makes a huge mess. And it's the same thing with when we have words that come out of our mouths that when when we say something to one of our family members or to somebody and it's and it's mean spirited, it comes out and it makes a mess. And we can't put it back. Now, um, a a while back, I I used this stuff. It's called, it's like pond foam. It's for ponds. And it's for sealing up a waterfall to make the water flow over the rocks and not flow under it. So it looks really nice. This stuff, if you get it on your hands, it's not coming off. So watch as I spray some of this stuff here. Let's shake it up a little bit. Now look at that. It's gooey, and notice how it keeps coming. It just keeps going. Yeah, it's, but you don't want to touch it. In fact, uh, during the pandemic, when we had, didn't have church for about a, a month or two, um, I was up here, and I had just been working with this stuff, and I was doing announcements, and I had it all over my hands, and it, it doesn't come off for like two weeks. So I had it on my hands, and then, and then I, I heard back from someone that, what's wrong with his hands? And one of the kids in the church told their parent, like, what's wrong with pastor's hands? You know, they were all, they had this stuff, it gets on you, and it does not come off. And notice how it just keeps coming. It's kind of like that. When you get angry, you know, in that verse it says, in your anger, do not sin. When you get angry, sometimes stuff just starts coming out, and it doesn't stop. And so that's why that verse is talking about Don't let corrupting talk come out of your mouth. And in your anger, do not sin, which means you're going to be angry at times. That's going to happen, but don't sin. How do you not sin? Well, probably the best way is when you start getting angry, you start realizing you're getting angry, maybe you need to get 
away and pray and talk to God. Like, Lord, help me. Jesus, help me. I need some help here. I'm getting angry. What's the best way for me to respond in this situation? And it'll bring peace to your home. And then you'll build people up rather than tear them down. Okay? So that's why I wanted to show you this. It's kind of a cool little um, uh, object lesson. I usually use toothpaste for this, but this is even more like this. You think toothpaste causes a mess? You don't want to get that on your hands. Like you can so, get toothpaste on your hands and then wash it off. Yeah, well, you couldn't wash this off. So, and that's kind of, you know, when you say things with your mouth, you guys, sometimes when you hurt someone, you can't take it back, and it makes a mess. It gets on, and it, it doesn't come off for a while. It really hurts. So let's pray, and let's pray that God would help us um, be kind and building up in our families with our words, okay? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Oh, how we need it consistently in our lives. Oh, we have this sin that so easily entangles us and pulls us in the wrong direction, causes us to hurt those that we love most in our family. Lord, in our homes, behind closed doors, that's where real authentic life happens. We learn about ourselves because we see the real us coming out. So Lord, when we, when we see ugliness coming out, pray that we would turn to you, that we know that, that you are there to forgive us and, and wipe away that sin and make us clean because of your blood shed on the cross that you, that you want to forgive us. And then help us to forgive others as you have forgiven us and to be reminded of that. Help us with our words not to make a mess with relationships and to be kind and up building, building up of others. In your name we pray, amen. All right, you guys can go to Children's Church. I want to have you guys stand up one more time as we sing one more song. We're, song. We're going to sing Christ Be Magnified. So let's go ahead and stand as we sing that song. Be mad.
I'll stand strong and worship you. And if it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice because you're there too. I won't be formed by feelings. I hold fast to what is true. And if the cross brings transformation, then I'll be crucified with you. Because death is just a doorway into resurrection life. And if I join you in your sufferings, then I'll join you when you rise. And when you return in glory with all the angels and the saints, my heart will still be singing. My song will be the same. Church, you can probably already turn there, but you can turn to Ephesians 4, 25, verse 25. We're going to read through this again, and I want you to read through it with a little bit of a different lens, because usually when we read this verse, we think about our biological family. We think about family life. Uh, you think of the part here where it says, do not let, your son go, or, do not let the sun go down on your anger. We often think of, of marriage when we think of that because we think of going to bed at night and don't let the sun go down on your, on your anger. And so a lot of times this text gets, gets uh, looked at as just for family, but really it is a family text, but it's the church family is who he's, what he's actually talking about. He's talking about your local church body of believers that you know and do life with and um, and sometimes get frustrated with and, and, and because it's messy and, and, and humans are, are messy people. We just, we're just messy. And so that is what he's talking about. So I want you to think about um, the church when we read this, okay? Before we do that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, would you speak to us through your word this morning, a fresh and a new, a, a text that we're very familiar with. Lord, uh, Help us not to be apathetic in our familiarity, but Lord, that we would allow you to speak to us afresh and anew. And Lord, make your church be the light, the shining light in the world that you have called us to be. In your name, amen. Verse 25, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you Speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. 
So much in that text and so challenging. And if you think about uh, the Roman Empire, it is very similar to uh, the, uh, our American culture today. That's why I, I really love the fact that we can relate so much with the Scripture because it's very similar. The Roman Empire was like a melting pot of society. America is the same way. You had barbarians, you had Samaritans, you had the, the Greeks, the Romans, then you had Jews, Gentiles, and Jews, and you had they all had different ways of living. And, and so as they're coming into the church, they're very different from one another. They look different, they eat different, they act different, and so it caused a lot of friction and a lot of tension at times. And, uh, and so here, here in Ephesians, Paul says, therefore, and he's actually referring back, of course, to everything he just said. And it, just a quick overview, uh, Ephesians uh, chapter 2, we're told that we are saved by grace, that it is not by our works so that no one can boast. So he's like, when you're coming into the church, don't be boastful and prideful. It's you're saved by grace. There's no room for that in the church. Uh, and, and then he goes on, he says, you were created in Christ Jesus to do good works. That is your destiny. That's who you are. This is your new identity as a follower of Christ. And then he goes on to talk about um, those who are alienated from God. And he's talking especially about the Gentiles. He says, you have been brought into the fellowship from darkness into light. And so he, he addresses that in chapter 3. And then at the end of chapter 3, I love this statement. At the end of chapter 3, he says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, more than we can even imagine or what we can think. He does more than that. According to the power at work within us, this is who you are, the power of God in you, the mystery of the gospel, Christ in you. According to that, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And then he goes on, verse 1 of chapter 4, he says, therefore. And then verse 25, therefore, referring back, so, we don't do this thing called church and relationship and family. We don't do it out of our own, like, mustering up our, oh, I'm, I'm going to be a pretty good Christian. We do it because of what Christ has done. We do it because of what he has done in us. And we do it because this is who we are, children of God, of the King of Kings. And, and so we, we live authentic real lives together, loving one another, being quick to forgive, not letting corrupting talk come out of our mouths, but only such that's going to build people up and help them grow. doesn't mean that it's always easy talk. It may be a, a, a talk of correction every once in a while, but there's a lot of encouragement that goes with that as well. And there's going to be times where you're going to have those tough conversations, but the goal of those tough conversations is to build up, to help that person grow. And you do it in humility because of what Christ has done for us. And notice how at the beginning of this text, he uses that word members, members of one another. For you are members of one another. You belong together. You're brought into a fellowship together. Last Sunday, we talked about fellowship. We talked about what is Christian fellowship and what is its purpose. We... Two things that are clear in Scripture. Christian fellowship is committed. It's devoted. It doesn't give up. It's continually devoted to that person. And then it, it is for the purpose of perseverance. Because sin is so deceitful. And we cannot do this thing, this fight, this life, fighting the good fight. We cannot do it alone. We're not meant to do it alone. We're meant to do it with our brothers and sisters in Christ, in the church, building each other up, fanning each other in, in, in the flame to be passionate for Christ. And so that's where we find the real relationships that happen in the church. And it's not always exactly how we see in the scripture, especially in our culture today. We're so easily led to focus on other things and to forget real relationship. We're so focused on entertainment 
I think that's a big problem in American culture and even has crept in the church is it's just so easy to treat even the church as entertainment that, you know, I don't know if I want to go to this church anymore because that church has got something better, a better program, and we don't treat it as real about relationship and this, this uh, challenge for us to be a part of what God is doing. It kind of reminds me of what JFK said a long time ago. Don't ask what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And we should be asking that, like, what can we do for the church? First, we should be asking the question, is this church built on the Bible, and is it preaching the Word of God? And if it is, and is it, is it a part of the mission of, of reaching the, a lost world? If it is, I want to be a part of that. I want to get involved, and I want to I grow, and I want to help others grow, and I want to experience real, authentic church life with other people. A while back, I read a uh, um, biography on a missionary, and I've read lots of those, uh, we used to read them with our kids. I missed reading that with them when they were homeschooled. There was one about, I think this one was on Adoniram Judson. He was in Burma and away from any Christians, all by himself with his family. A lot of his family died from disease, and he's just alone. And there are so many times where he, he I remember him talking about how he longed for Christian fellowship. And, I, and as I was reading that, I thought, what has it got to look to missionaries like that who might actually be watching the church and what's going on today? You know, Hebrews 11, and oh, we've had long discussions with Gary, and I've had discussions about this. Like, can people, do people watch from heaven? Do they see what's going on in this, in this earth? And that's a whole other discussion. But if they do, I wonder what they think about the American church. I can't tell you how many times I've heard, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. I hear that all, all the time. Or you don't have to be in a church building to, to be a Christian. And I'm like, yeah, this, this building is, uh, is man-made. It's, it's not just about this building and the color of carpet or whatever else. It's not about that stuff, but it is about the people that assemble here that are committed and devoted to one another. And, and I, I just think to myself, I don't understand what they realize the church is supposed to be about. Because while God is not going to ask us when we stand before him someday, what church were you a member of? He's not going to ask that. The question will be, were you washed in the blood of the Lamb? That's going to be the question. Because we're not saved by works, but by grace. But the scriptures are crystal clear about the journey of the Christian life and how we are to be committed to one another and not, not forsake meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. And, and that's why like the whole New Testament is, is written to churches. So I don't see how you can read your Bible and not recognize that you need to be fellowshipping with believers and you need to be devoted to the church. And when you are, you'll experience the abundant life that Christ called you to live. But I think sometimes that people approach church similar to how they approach marriage in our country. What can I get out of it for myself? I'm going to be happy. This is going to make me happy. But marriage is about making you holy more than it's about making you happy. You see, when you, when you have two people together who love Jesus, they're supposed to be helping each other grow. And it's not always a happy bed of roses, but eventually the real joy and happiness comes when you focus on Christ. And that's the church. It's the same way. It's not always going to be easy. Relationship is messy. People are messy. But God is going to use those people to help you be a better person at forgiving others. Be a better person at not letting corrupting talk come from your mouth because when you're frustrated with somebody, it tests that. And then you experience real relationship that way. But we are so, and it seems increasingly dependent upon just our own comforts and removing ourselves out of the lives of other people. I talked about a couple weeks ago, good vibes only, right? I don't want any negativity in my life. I don't want to have to deal with 
people that frustrate me at times. I don't want to have to worry about having real relationship with people because people are messy. And then I wonder about guys like Adoniram Judson who see this, and it almost reminds me uh, of someone I know who is a really bad alcoholic, sadly, and he used to be big into fishing. He used to be a big fisherman. He has two fishing boats. If you were to see his garage, he's got fish all over the wall, and he never goes fishing anymore. And it's so sad to me. He's missing out on that. And then, you know, I even asked him, I was like, would you have you thought about selling your fishing boats? And one of them's really, really nice. And he was like, well, you know, $80,000 for both of them if you want them. I'm like, yeah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> you know, and, and so I'm thinking, because, man, I would love to have a fishing boat to take my son out fishing. And it makes me think of like similar to, to Adoniram Judson or these missionaries that long to have that Christian fellowship but couldn't have it because they were giving up that to create Christian fellowship somewhere else. And it took years of work. And then eventually the church was birthed. And then now today in those countries, they're able to experience true Christian fellowship because of the sacrifice of this guy. And you know, I wonder what they think about us who have freedom to worship and freedom to assemble and and. and And we don't have to worry about persecution like other areas of the world. And the gospel has been established here. The church has grown in America, and yet it's starting to shrink because of ridiculous, deceiving statements like, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. That's just a deception. Remember, see to it, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. Don't be deceived by the deceitfulness of sin. And so you're constantly taking care and thinking about the church and thinking about others, and that's what the church life is all about. So here in Ephesians 3, as he talks about these great challenges for us when it comes to relationship, he's saying, remember, you are members of one another. But today, people shy away from commitment so much. And it just seems to be getting worse and worse with each generation. Did you know that that, that marriage, the marriage commitment has just gotten less and less and less with people not getting married with each generation? I want you to show you a stat here. It's a picture I have. This, This is an example of, and this is from Pew Research. And you can find this actually on multiple Um, sites online. It's not just this one group. But look at how the generations, it's gotten worse and worse with the commitment to family. The millennials, 45% are not in a family. 45%. That is staggering. We really shy away from commitment a lot today. And so it, does, it shouldn't surprise us if that's the case when it comes to the church as well, that we don't know what it is to be truly devoted to one another. It's just too easy to focus on our own independence and comforts and just let everybody else do their thing. And yet, you wonder why the world is so lonely today. It seems to me that there's a lot more loneliness today than there used to be. And I think that is because we haven't been experiencing true, authentic relationships. I was just talking to little kids. I was like, guys, your family is where you have the most real relationships with people. Behind closed doors, your family members can tell you, tell others about you, your strengths and your weaknesses. They really can. Other people can. It's easy to go to work and put on a happy face, but your family knows you well. And so that's where authentic relationship happens, and God uses that if we're devoted to one another and if we're doing family and we're doing church family with the right purpose and the right motives, then God uses that to help us grow. So we need to get back to that. You want to demonstrate true commitment and agape love to your kids? Do you want to demonstrate that? Do you want your kids to grow up loyal Caring, 
They really love people. They really care about other people. And, and they're loyal to the point of when someone offends them, they work through it. They don't just give up on that relationship. Well, God gave you two gifts to demonstrate that to your kids. Two gifts. The family, your family, and then the second, the local church. And that is how we experience authentic, loyal relationships with people. So God gave you those two gifts, and it's a tragedy that the majority of people today have thrown away these great gifts on the altar of self-fulfillment, comfort, and advancement. We're throwing away these two great gifts that God has given us. You know, I used to, um, I used to not be sure about what I thought about church membership. Like, why, why have church membership? Because, um, you know, I've been to enough church business meetings over my, you know, 30-some years of life where I actually remember the church business meetings, you know, where I was actually in them. And so I've seen the good ones and I've seen the bad ones and arguing over the color of carpet or whatever. And there are, in my generation, I think people are like, they don't even want to be a part of it. But if you really think about it, we argue about that stuff in our families, don't we? You know, have you ever tried to build a house with your spouse? Ever, anybody, well, where's, it's too bad Randy and Rita aren't here. They're, they're, they're working together on that right now, building a house. You, if you go to build a house, you have to decide what countertop and what carpet and what, what paint. And There's just so many decisions. It's extremely overwhelming. Uh, and you have to like work through that together. And there are going to be times where you're going to get frustrated usually. Well, no, I want this countertop. No, no that's not going to look right. And you get frustrated. So it happens in the church as well. And we have to be willing to forgive, and we have to be willing to, to be gracious to one another. And, and it's, like a, it's even like a football team. you got, you got a coach that calls a play, and you're like, why do you call that play? And you can be frustrated for a little bit, but you have to move past that and realizing you're on the same team with the goal of advancing the ball to score a touchdown. And we as the church are on the same team with advancing the goal of reaching what we just sang about, every tribe and tongue and nation. We have uh, too big a fish to fry to worry about the little things that don't fit our personal agenda. And we have to work through that. So I used to struggle with, you know, church membership. Is it biblical? I don't really see church membership the way I've done it in my life in Scripture. But the Scriptures are not like prescriptive of every little detail in church life. It gives us the overarching purpose. It gives us a framework of which to build church. And as I was studying this last week, I became more solid in believing more that church membership is a biblical thing. And I want to show you that this morning. Because I've always thought, well, church membership is good. It's beneficial. I think it's important when you're talking about relationship and commitment to have it be public. That's what church membership is. It's a public thing. If you're going to become a member of a church, then everybody knows that this person is a member of our church. And so it's a public thing that you do, a commitment that you make. And I always thought that was beneficial. That's good. I mean, we have public commitments to marriage. We have a marriage ceremony, and there's people a part of that. And, and you commit to this person for the rest of your life. And, and so you have also church membership, where it is a public thing that you commit to this body of believers. And I've always thought that was good, but I've, I've struggled with where do you find this in Scripture? So first, we just read Ephesians 4.25, which says, you are members of one another. Now, the question is, is this talking about the big C church, the universal church, or Christians all over the world? Or is this talking about the, like, the little C church, the local body that you're a part of, that you're members of? And I personally believe that it's talking about the, the little C church because Paul is speaking to the Ephesian church, one church, and the way that he talks about their relationship is, is not like people in Philippi or people in Rome. You can't have this kind of relationship with those people. They're too far away. You're not going to uh, steal from them. You're not going to be dishonest to them. You're not going to say mean things about them, but maybe with people that you know. So I believe he's talking about that local church. He says, listen, you're members of one another. 
But is it just this text or are there others? Let's look at a couple others here. Ephesians 2, uh, verse 41. We just read that last Sunday. Verse 41. It says, So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Okay, so, so that gives us a little bit more of a picture. Okay, so they were baptized... And then that was a public thing, and they were a part of the church, and they had like a number on it. They knew how many people. And then if you go down to verse 47, it says this of chapter 2 of Acts, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So it was like they're keeping track of who is in the church, who is a part of this body and who is committed to this body of believers. And the greatest indicator that we can tell for church membership was baptism, which is why if you were to become a member of Riverside, you need to be baptized. And we do recognize that if you were baptized at another church and it was after you were saved, that it's believer's baptism, that 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 it was a public thing and we're not going to have you get, like our water is no more special than another church's water, right? But it was a public, obedient commitment that you made, and then we would then explain to the church that you had been baptized. So they were baptized. It was public. They're not hiding their faith away, and they're adding to their number day by day. Now turn to Acts 6, verse 1 through 2. You fast forward a little bit here. It says this, Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint, whoa, wait, wait, complaints? Yeah, early church makes me feel better. It's like, you know, like, I tend to try to be perfectionist with things in my life, and it's like, oh, Lord, why do we have problems? It's like, it's always, it's always be problems. The early church had problems. Complaints by the, the Hellenist, and here we go with the melting pot, right, arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So you had clicks in the church. That's just like what we do as people. It like never changes, right? So you had these clicks, and they were complaining, and the 12 summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit, and of wisdom, whom, we'll, whom we will appoint to this duty. And then it goes on and on. And, and, and it's interesting how at verse 7 it says, And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So the disciples, again, the great number of disciples multiplied. So he says, Choose from among you, among all the disciples, You're supposed to go into the world and make disciples. And and if you're a believer in Christ, you need to know you are a disciple. You, you're called to be a disciple of Christ. You're living for a purpose. And the apostles, which were those who, had, who were trained by Christ and, and, and saw the risen Christ, they're choosing, they're the leaders, and they're choosing men to become deacons and serve in the church. Now, my question is this. How would they know who to choose from if it wasn't clear who were a part of the church and who was a part of the church and who wasn't? I believe it's because of baptism and I believe it's because of membership. Ephesians. Because there were, he says, you're members of one another. We know each other. We know this person is committed to the faith. How would they even know how to go through church discipline with somebody? Because they would have people visit and come. And you never know how long they're going to stay. 1 Corinthians 5.12 speaks of this. You can turn there as well. So you kind of have to go through a bunch of different texts to get a a picture of what was going on in the early church. 1 Corinthians 5.12 says, For what have I to do with judging outsiders? It is not those, is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? And that whole American statement, don't judge. He actually says that you should be judging. The church should be judging those inside the church when they're living in sin. 
somebody's living in sin, and in this, that instance, it was a, a man who had his father's wife. You know, he was, he was committing adultery with his father's wife. And he's like, don't let this just, you guys have to deal with this because a lot is at stake. We are to be a light to the world. And when people see hypocrisy inside the church, it is a stench on the gospel. And so deal with it. And he's saying, how do you deal with it? Well, it's those inside the church. How do you know who's inside the church? Well, those who are committed, who have publicly devoted, they said, I'm, I'm committed to this body of believers. I don't know how else you can figure out who's inside the church and, and who's not. But I think this is important. It's important for us to really think about and pray about. And I don't know if you're a member of Riverside or not, wherever you're at, pray about that. Pray about becoming a devoted committed member of this church, being a part of what's going on here and the mission of this church. What is church membership anyways? This is my personal belief on what church membership is. It's a formal and public commitment to a local body of believers for the purpose of fellowship, submission, and accountability to the headship of Christ. Remember we talked about the headship of Christ over the church. Who's the head of the church? Christ. And how is Christ the head of the church? Well, he's the head of the church because the church leaders are devoted to the public preaching of the word of God and the teaching of the word of God. So anything that's taught inside the church is through the scripture. And that is how Christ remains the head of the church. So it's not my opinions. It's not a, a, a political opinion that we're going to push. We don't push political agendas. We push the word of God. We push the gospel. And that is what saves. And that is what, what, what sanctifies people. And so Christ is the head of the church. And when you be, you, you're devoted to that church, you're saying, I'm going to submit to the headship of Christ. So I'm submitting to this church and Christ's headship of this church. And I, and I, and I want to have real fellowship. And remember the purpose of fellowship to promote perseverance in your faith and to be committed to one another even when it's hard. The purpose, so I had to make this into two statements. I actually had to send this to uh, um, Monica because she's good, better with grammar and stuff than I am. I was like, can you help me with this sentence? Because it was like a super long sentence. I'm like, that, that's got to be a run-on sentence. I just know it. So I don't know how, but it's got to be. So send it to her. She made it into two sentences. The purpose of membership is for discipleship, spiritual growth, and support of the church's mission through service and giving. So discipleship, spiritual growth, and support of God's mission on this earth until he returns. That is church membership. And it's a public, formal commitment to a local body. I've heard a, a, it described once by a pastor that Becoming a member of a church is similar to like a, a football team. Like you get traded, a guy gets traded from the Bears, and then he goes to the Packers. You don't keep the Bears jersey on, you put the Packers jersey on. And, and uh, the person who described to me about this, I don't even know who this pastor was, but the person who described to me that this pastor said this, he's like, yeah, but aren't we all on the same team? And see, that is a horrible illustration for church membership. It just is. It's just a bad illustration. What is a healthy illustration of church members? I was trying to think, okay, what would be a healthy one? And I thought, oh, I know. A squadron in, like, the Marines. I don't know if they have squadrons in Air Force. I, you know, that, that group, that band of brothers that they, they're committed to one another. They know one another. They, have like a, they even have, like, a, an emblem and a creed, and, uh, and the way they do things might be a little different from another, another squadron, but they're all a part of the same team, fighting the battle to win the war, and that is what church membership, I think that's a good illustration, right? Like We are members of this, we know each other, we help each other out, we have each other's back, we're devoted to one another, 
And, we're, and why? Because we are in a battle, a war, where we have an enemy who wants to seek, kill, and destroy. And he, he does it by getting into our mind and deceiving us with sin and leading us astray and using our flesh and all of the influences of the world and bringing us away from God's will for our life. And so we need each other. We're brothers and sisters, and we're fighting the good fight. And that's what church membership is about, church. That's exciting to me when I think about that. So... So again, I ask you, like, where are you at with this? Like, are you committed to this local body? Man, we, let's build up our ranks. Let's, let's do what the early church did. Like, add to our number and, and, ex, and be excited about, about what God's doing and committed to one another and devoted to fellowship and devoted to his cause on this earth. About two years ago, we decided to take pictures at Easter Sunday because people didn't know each other. We had a lot of newer families, and you know, as before, of course, the pandemic hit and all that. And I was like, man, I, I want people to know each other's names. So we, we got these pictures in the bulletin board out there. And, and, and as I think about it now, I think that was kind of a mistake. And, and the reason why I say that was because it was Easter Sunday. And not only did you have like, because you have people that are members, formal members, but then you have people that consistently come to this church and are like, this is my church. They haven't gone through full membership, but they're like, this is my church. And then you have people that come that you don't know like where they're at. They're probably going to come for two weeks. That's like classic Easter, right? Oh, that was a good sermon. I'll come the night. And then, then, then that sermon was a little bit too convicting and they leave. You know, I don't know. I don't know why they leave, but they leave. And so you had their picture up there and now it's just awkward because you got these pictures up there. You don't want to take them down because it seems kind of mean. But you're like, nobody knows these people. It's almost like if I were to have like a big party for my whole neighborhood and have them over and say, okay, we're going to take pictures of you guys and we're going to put them on the walls of our house. Nobody would do that, right? So, so I'm kind of like stuck with that right now. But eventually I'd like to change that <laughs> to where it's like people that we know are devoted to this church. And, and, uh, and so I, I, I want to, I'm trying to think through all this, but that's just an example of how easy it is to, for someone to come for a while and then just, dis it happens all the time in churches. It happens all the time, in every church. And I was talking to a, a, a pastor this last week about this, and he said, oh man, getting people like, like they'll come for a while, but getting them like really where they feel a part of that, that body or that's like their family is one of the biggest challenges of ministry. And he's been a pastor for 30 years. It's like, it is the biggest challenge. And so I think the best way to get over that challenge is to encourage the church, be devoted to your local body. Christ wants you to, to do that. And, and, and I, I personally see it, church membership is a great, it's probably one of the best ways to do that. And then you're a part of what's going on. You're also helping with keeping the leadership accountable to the word of God. Like when we go through this, this uh, uh, leadership proposal, if it's not biblical, you need, to, you need to present, if you're like, the Bible says this, and and this, this isn't, I don't think we're on the right track here. And then that keeps the leadership accountable. So that's what membership does. It also helps keep the leadership accountable formally, legally even. How does someone become a member of our church? There's really just two stages. You meet with me. I hear your testimony. We go over like the beliefs of our church. We go over how our church runs. If you have any questions, we work through that. I hear your testimony, I encourage, I usually, I encourage people to write out their testimony because the next step is then to come to the deacons, which is usually sometimes six, six to eight guys, whoever's there, and then you share your testimony with the deacons, and then if you've been, if you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you're a brother and sister in Christ, you've been born again, you are then brought into our church, and the whole church, there's a vote of affirmation that happens. It's really a vote of affirmation based on the fact that you are, you are a believer in Christ and you've been baptized. If you haven't been baptized, awesome, because that means I get to baptize you, and I, I love to do that. So, so I, when I hear about somebody who hasn't been baptized, I'm like, oh, yes, yes, sweet, and I get to baptize them. So, um, I mean, it's not just I like to just dunk people. You know, I, I, I do like to do that with our youth, but... Um, so that's really the steps. It's, it's, it, it is a simple process to understand what goes on at this church, and we want to make sure that you are a believer in Christ. And, and then our hope is to get you involved in some way, involved in some way that fits your gifting. And that's something I'm trying to do better with with our, with our, our members, those who are getting a part, being, becoming a part of this church. 
Lastly, in, in, in Acts 2, I don't want to skim over this. Um, Acts 2, verse 42, it says that they were devoted to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayer and prayer. The church should always be devoted to prayer. I want to give you an a advertisement. I don't know, advertisement's a bad word. But Thursday, if you, if you don't work Thursday morning or you're retired, Thursday at 9 a.m., we have a prayer meeting. We pray for the needs of this church. We pray for people outside this church as well. And every Thursday we pray. And I would love for you to join us. Jim Miller used to come to that every single week. And it's just sad that he's, for us, that he's with the Lord. Um, but he was just so devoted to that. Um, he had just retired and he was just so devoted to that. I want to encourage you, if, if you're retired, you have the time, 9 a.m. Thursday, we'd love to have you come pray. And we solve all the world problems before we pray. <laughs> no, we, we don't, only, only he does. But we, how we solve the world problems is we say, Lord, these are the problems going on. Help us, Lord. And then we have peace knowing that he's sovereign. And we've cast our cares on him. So do that and pray Pray for your church, pray, pray for this church, pray for the church and uh, the big C church all over the world and pray for yourself and your family and ask God. If you're not a member here, I want to encourage you, ask God. God, is this, are you calling me to take that step to be, to be a member of this church? And I get it that a lot of times people don't do that because of bad experiences. But I'm going to tell you this, I do believe that Satan likes to use that to keep people from being devoted. It's kind of like someone has experienced a bad family life growing up and then they're afraid to get married because of that. Well, that's not the answer. Living with someone for the rest, no, no, get married. It, it, it's, it's an opportunity to experience what true marriage is all about. And so I want to encourage you to, to pray about that and ask the Lord to guide and direct you. Whatever the case is, no. I love you no matter what. You don't become a member of this church. We love you. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We want you to know that, that, that that is the most important thing in the world is that you know Christ as your Savior. So let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word that truly uh, challenges us, challenges us to be authentic. It's so hard, <laughs> it seems increasingly so, to have authentic relationships with people. But Lord, we thank you that your word is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, that it is the light unto our path, and that, Lord, you call us out of the, the boat uh, uh, that, that keeps us away from other people into real, authentic relationships. Lord, help us to honor you in the relationships that you've given us, that you've put into our life. In your name we pray, amen. So one of the most famous and one of the most, I guess, well-known uh, tunes for a hymn is the tune to Joyful, Joyful, We Adore You or Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Uh, those are two different hymns. Uh, but it's one that probably everybody here in, in this room knows. And we're going to sing uh, the first verse of Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Uh, but there's also another uh, a hymn in our hymn book called The Servant Song. And it, and it, and it just goes through exactly what, what TJ was talking about, about brothers and sisters coming together to serve each other and to serve the cause of, of the church. And it's going to be sung to the same tune as Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. So uh, I just want to let you guys know that as we go ahead and uh, sing that song, let's go ahead and stand. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. Joyful, 
Brother, sister, let me serve you. Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. We are pilgrims on a journey. We're together on this road. We are here to help each other walk the mile and bear the load. And I will hold the Christ light for you in the night time of your fear. I will hold my hand out to you, speak the peace you long to hear. I will weep when you are weeping, when you laugh, I'll laugh with you. I will share your joy and sorrow till we've seen this journey through. When we sing to God in heaven, we shall find such harmony. Born of all we've known together, of Christ's love and agony. Brother, sister, let me serve you. Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. Let's sing that last line one more time. Brother, sister, let me serve you. Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. And first, uh, sorry, First Thessalonians chapter three. says, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Be blessed this week. You are dismissed.